Alex Hutchinson, welcome back to the show. Thanks a lot, Brad. It's great to be back. So we had you on the podcast last year to talk about your book, Endure, which is about the science of athletic performance. I recently picked up, and that's episode number 382, for those who want to check that out. I recently picked up a book you published back in 2011. So that's like eight years ago. Digging um, into the archives. Awesome. Right. <laughs> So your book's called Which Comes First, Cardio or Weights, Fitness Myths, Training Truths, and Other Surprising Discoveries from the Science of Exercise. And in it, you take these questions people often wonder about in regards to fitness, and you see these varied answers you know, in blogs and in magazines, and then you dig into the research to try to offer well-vetted answers. So I wanted to bring you back on to discuss some of this stuff because I know a lot of people have these questions and it's hard to find good answers to them. So let's talk about the the question that you use for the title of your book. What do you do first, cardio or weights, and which one and why? The the answer, of course, is, you know, it depends, and the answer is both. You should do cardio or weights. But in terms of which one you should do first, when I wrote the book, there was an emerging area of research, which was looking at the molecular signals that are triggered by exercise. So why is it that when I lift a weight, you know, my, my muscles know to get bigger. And when I go for a run, my muscles know to produce more mitochondria so that they improve their endurance. Well, there's, there's a set of uh, molecular signals, one of which, and there's basically two pathways. One pathway help triggers strength gains and the other pathway triggers endurance gains. And there's some really neat evidence that shows that these pathways are kind of conflicting with each other that that once you've if you start out and set your body for build strength it takes some time to switch it to the build endurance setting of you know, molecular pathways and so that argument kind of backs up the conventional wisdom which is that wh- whichever is most important to you is what you should do first so people have said that for a long time because it's like well if you want to build strength you shouldn't do it after your cardio because then you're going to be tired and you're not going to be able to lift as much but this was adding some some molecular heft to that which was that actually you're setting your cells to adapt to whichever one you do first. Now, the updated view on that, so this book came out in 2011, and most of what is in the book I think is still absolutely current, but there's a few areas which we may get to where I think where I would update my thinking. And my updated thinking on that is that these molecular effects are real, but they're far less important than what's convenient for an individual person. And, you know, we're talking about for 99.9% of people, maybe not for some, you know, an Olympic yeah, athlete, but for most of us, I think the differences are so small now as the studies have progressed that it's like, if you're forcing yourself to do something in an order that is less fun or less convenient for you to get that 0.1 or 0.5% benefit, you may be shooting yourself in the foot. So I'll give you an example. I do, you know, running is, is my sport and I do running. Running is most important to me. But when I do strength training, which I do as, as sort of bodyweight circuits in a local park, I do that before my run because I know that if I go for my run and I, if I have 45 minutes to work out, I will run for 44 and a half minutes and then be like, okay, now I have 30 seconds. I'm going to do three pushups. And that's not very useful. So I force myself to do the thing that's less fun for me to make sure that I don't cut it short. So anyway, the, the, that's the molecular answer. And then that's my practical answer, which is the differences are too small to worry about. So for most of us, you should do whatever's convenient, whatever is fun, whatever works for you. So the takeaway is that if you're really focused on optimizing your fitness modality, then do that type of exercise first. Yeah. So if you're really into weightlifting, then you do your lifting first and then cardio. And if you're focused on running, then it's the reverse. But, but really, it's probably the most important thing to do is whatever order works best for you and your schedule and your desires. And of course, this all assumes you're you're trying to do both on the same day. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you can do them at separate times, and 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 you can and you know it is common sense, right? Like for, from we we mo- all of us tend to kind of eat dessert first in the sense of do whatever's m- most important to us. That's the natural assumption, and I think the science, the the sort of microbiology, backs that view up. But ultimately, y- you should you should let your 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 order be dictated by yeah whatever works best for you. Right. All right. So a lot of people start working out because they want to get in shape. Now let's talk about that word, that phrase, get in shape, because that means can mean different things to different people. What exactly, do, are we talking about like appearance? Or are we talking about conditioning or is it both? How do you use, what are you talking about when you say get in shape? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the phrase has, has that sort of meaning baked into it. We're talking about the shape of the body, right? And uh, really what, you know, getting fit or getting in shape is means different things to different people. I don't think there's a, one right answer, but I think it's important to be, you know, honest with yourself and to think carefully about what, what it is you're looking for. For me, you know, I've gone through different stages in my life. Uh, when I was a seriously competitive runner, getting fit meant how fast can I run a mile? 
That's all getting fit meant. I didn't care if I looked like Jabba the Hutt, if I could run a fast mile. As time has gone on, my focus is more on health and longevity and, you know, getting, being functional and competent through the day. And if I go on a canoe trip or whatever, being able to lift the canoe over my head. So it's, it's a mix of, you know, some things that are visible, like, can I lift, can I get out of a chair, you know, without falling over and some things that are invisible, like what's, what is my blood pressure or whatever. And then there's the, the, you know, the third factor, which is aesthetics, which it's easy to talk down. And I, I would, I would encourage people not to make that their primary goal, but it's also let, you know, let's be honest, it is a, a factor that's important to people and has to be considered. So there's all these things and there's not one right answer for what being fit means, but you have to be clear on what you mean. So if you're, if you're going to say, does this workout program work? Well, it depends on what the outcome is. And and I think the the biggest thing is that a lot of people are judging their fitness purely off what they see on the scale or in the mirror. And they're make, making the erroneous conclusion that, ah, oh, man, this workout program is is pointless. It didn't do anything for me. And you're like, actually, your your life expectancy just increased by 10 years over the last six months. Uh, you may not see that in the mirror on the scale, but if you understand that there's these other markers that are super important in the long term, I think that's helpful to remember and helps to encourage people to stick with their with their fitness programs. So yeah, let's dig into this a little bit more. So as you said, as soon as you start exercising, you are experiencing benefits on a molecular level. You might not even see yet, but you might not see those results. You might not improve your running time after a workout, or you might not increase your bench press max after a workout. Let's say if your your goal is to endurance, you know, improve your endurance, how long does it take for for people to see improvements on that as they start after they start exercising? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I would say like just to go back to to what you what you said during the question is there's this spectrum of like if you do one workout and then you do like a glucose challenge test, see how much your insulin is going to rise in response to a, a set level of drink, you know, drinking a set level of sugar, you have already gotten healthier. Like one workout is already changing your body's ability to manage its blood sugar. On the flip side, you know, there've been studies where people do things like, okay, let's take a bunch of, you know, popular exercise programs that are advertised, you know, body for life kind of things. Uh, and let's put a bunch of people through the six week program that is going to transform you from the 97 pound weakling and yada, yada, yada. And then they have put people in front of a, a jury uh, you know, they're, they're, people have to judge the the pictures of before and after and try and figure which one's before, which one's after, see if there's any difference. And the bottom line is, for the, in the vast majority of cases, people can't tell a difference after six weeks. Like, they've worked hard for six weeks, and, and the, the promised gains for all but a very lucky few are invisible. So... Now, building muscle is one thing. If, if you're talking about endurance, which is, of course, my sort of specialty, you can absolutely see changes in your fitness within two or three weeks. And and the same is true for muscles. If you look, if you're measuring carefully enough, there's there's it's actually it's actually an ongoing area of debate. Like when you start lifting weights, you very quickly start to see some strength gains. That's mostly from like within you know a, a week or whatever. That's mostly neuromuscular. Your your brain is getting better at sending signals to your muscles. Within about two or three weeks, you can see if you're measuring with an accurate enough device that your muscles are getting bigger. Now there's arguments right now, but is that really bigger muscles or is that just like muscle damage causing a little bit of inflammation? And that's that, that's an area of ongoing debate, but certainly within, let's say, four weeks or something, your muscles are getting bigger. It's just not this kind of change that that is you know visible when you're walking down the street in your tank top. Now, so how quickly it takes depends a little bit on how hard you're willing to work. And so in some of the studies that see the really early muscle gain, we're talking like four workouts a week supervised by a personal trainer who's, you know, yelling at you and beating you with a baseball bat if you don't lift hard enough. It's not, a well, I mean, I'm exaggerating here in case that's not clear, but it's definitely four workouts a week, very hard. And it's not something that's sustainable for most people, especially if they're not like being supervised and, and yelled at. So my, my, my rule of thumb is if you want to see benefits, you, you, you should, you should just not even worry about where you are until six months after six months. That's the time to say, okay, is this working the way I think it is? Or do I need to adjust? Uh, if you, if you're, if you're taking the pot off the stove after two months, you just don't know whether it's working yet. Are you saying like six months is for uh, improvement in fitness or improvement in aesthetics or appearance? For aesthetics, I would say six months is the the bare minimum unless you're you're first of all a super responder and second of all like going from an uh, untrained state. You know, you've been locked in a cell for five years, not moving, and now you're really starting to 
to train six days a week or something, then you know you're going to see changes much more quickly. But I would say for for seeing changes six months, yeah, for 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 changing fitness and strength and endurance and health, you know, we're talking weeks. Although you know it's it's a dose response. It's small changes in weeks, bigger changes in months, huge changes in years. So that's that's good to know. That manages the expectations for people. Let's talk about, let's say you stop exercising for whatever reason. Maybe you get injured or you get really busy and you can't get to the gym or you take a longer vacation. How long does it take for you to get unfit? Yeah, it, so there's, you know, it depends on your definition of unfit. And and one thing is that the longer you've been training, the longer your fitness is going to, longer you can kind of skate by with minimal training. Part of that is that, again, speaking of endurance, it's like, there are some things that are sort of ephemeral, like uh, the mitochondrial content of your cells is a big factor in endurance, and that can rise and fall. But there are other things that are structural, like your you, you've your heart is bigger and stronger, and you've grown more capillaries to deliver blood to your muscles. Those things aren't going to disappear in two weeks. Those structural changes structural changes are going to last for quite a while. And the same with muscle too. If you if you put on a bunch of muscle, it doesn't just melt away, and in, in, if you don't work out for two or three weeks. It may you may lose a little strength in that your your, your neuromuscular signal isn't, isn't as good, but that muscle is still going to be there for you. So, uh, you know, I, to me, the, there's like, you know, again, it depends on the person, the context, but like you can go two weeks without exercising, and aside from being a bit rusty, you're not going to lose a ton. If you go four weeks without exercising, then you've lost a lot. That's that's the sort of range where four weeks is a lot, two weeks is not a lot, and. If you're time pressed, one of the things that the research shows is that a couple of hard workouts, you know, maybe twice a week, it doesn't have to be a long period of time, but if you push yourself just twice a week, that can maintain fitness for much, much longer. That's true in the endurance context. You get people who are training, you know, six days a week, and then you say, okay, now you can only train half an hour at a time twice a week. And if if you push it for that half an hour twice a week, you can maintain your fitness for a surprisingly long, you know, like a month or whatever. And I, I imagine the same thing is there, there's something similar in, in with strength tr- training, which is that you know even if you're used to maintaining a high load, as long as you're able to sh- you know shock those muscles once or twice a week, you're going to do a lot better than if you go. So I guess the, the message I'm trying to get across is here is that it's not all or nothing. It's not like oh I'm pretty busy, I can't do all my workouts, therefore I'm going to lie on the sofa and eat Cheetos. If you can find 15 minutes to get out there and hammer, even if it's a couple just a couple times a week, that that will do a, a lot. To, to make sure that you can pick up your fit, your routine again four weeks later or whatever it is or three weeks later when you ha- have more time. Yeah, that's what I do whenever... Um, I, I just exercise even when I don't have time just so I can maintain that habit, right? So like when I went on vacation this summer, I didn't have access to a gym, so I didn't have barbells. So what I did instead was did like a 15-minute body circuit workout. So it was like pull-ups, body squats, push-ups, and just went really, really hard on that. Did it three times a week, helped my work capacity go up. And I maintained that habit. So when I got back home, like it wasn't like, oh man, I got to start this all over again. I just kept going. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's a super important point. Like I, I've come to the, one, one of the sort of areas where my thinking has, has drifted a little bit or evolved a little bit is I've just come to believe that the, the habit forming elements and the psychology of exercise is so much more important than we sometimes think. We get, you know, we get focused on like how many reps should I do at what percentage of my max, and you know those things make a difference. But so much more important is understanding what it is that will enable you to maintain a consistent program, whatever that program is. So similar to you, like one of the things that I've I find is, you know, I get super busy and stressed out and think I don't have time to run today. Well, one of the ways I fight against that is that I say I say. Sometimes I'm like, I'm going to go out for a five minute run. Now that's ludicrous because I, I used to run an hour a day. And, and even these days, I like to get out for at least half an hour, five minutes. It, it seems stupid, even just when you think of the time it takes to change and shower, but I just want to maintain the habit. And if, if I go out for five minutes and I come back and that's it, then it's like, okay, that hasn't done a ton for me, but it's maintained my habit. And of course, often once I get out for five minutes, I'm like, am I really so busy that I can't extend this to 20 minutes? Of course not. I can find 15 minutes in the day. So I'll just end up getting my 20 minute run in. But even if I don't, I've, I've kept that routine going and haven't just gotten into the habit of like, I'm going to skip my run today. I always try and get out the door. And if I'm so stressed and busy that I, five minutes is all I feel I can handle, then that's fine. But, but I don't just make it all or nothing. All right. So something's better than nothing. 
is the takeaway. Absolutely. That, that's that's probably like if there's one message that people take away from from all of this, and and this is an answer to so many questions, is like, yeah, we can optimize, you know, up the wazoo, but ultimately something is always better than nothing. And for a large fraction of people, they're doing nothing or 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 they're trying to do all or nothing. They're 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 not they're they're not realizing that, you know, hey, sometimes you can't do what's perfect, but you gotta if you do something, you're gonna be way, way, way ahead of doing nothing. Well, yeah, that idea of something better than nothing, like that can go to how, which sort of fitness practice you choose. Because a lot of people feel like, well, I, I, I should do this, but they don't enjoy it. So they don't really do it. So like find something you actually like doing and you're going to be more likely to do it. And now it might not be, you know, Instagram worthy where you can like <laughs> show yourself, you know, running a <laughs> sub two hour marathon or deadlifting 700 pounds. But like if you're taking a hike or you're playing ultimate Frisbee, you know, a couple times a week, that's better than nothing. Uh, absolutely, and, and it's and it's actually in many ways it's better than like even very good options because if it's something you're going to keep doing for the next twenty years, then that's a huge win. And so again, like that's when I again this is an area I've been writing about for you know ten or fifteen years, and in in my evolution of thought, I I now tend to put a lot more emphasis on factors on things like that on the finding something sustainable rather than optimizing the details. And if I, I love optimizing the details. It's, it's, it's what interests me. And there's a lot of people who love that too. And I'm, that's, that's my bread and butter in terms of what I write about. But I'm really conscious now of trying to make sure that people don't take the message that just because I spent a thousand words writing about, you know, whether you should run at this pace or 10 seconds faster per mile or whatever, that doesn't mean that's what's most important. That's the 1%. The 99% is, yeah, find something you like doing and do it. All right, let's talk about weight loss and exercise because a lot of people start exercising, they want to lose weight, but I think everyone's seen those reports or research that shows that exercise doesn't contribute much to fat loss. What is, what's the research sound like? I imagine it's more nuanced than that. Yeah, I, I'll confess that I, I am a sort of min, maybe a minority opinion on this. I, I, I don't buy that stuff, or at least I, I would add the caveat. When, peop, when people say exercise doesn't contribute much to weight loss. What they're really saying is exercise at the levels that they're willing to do in these studies doesn't contribute much to weight loss. You know, if, and, and this is not true of all studies, but most studies are, are relatively just like, oh, you know, we had these people walking for half an hour, five days a week, and they only lost a couple pounds. There, there's two responses to that. One is that, okay, maybe they only lost a couple pounds, but I bet their metabolic health is way better. So th- there's there's huge value to to walking half an hour five times a week, but the other thing is like if you want to say exercise doesn't contribute to weight loss, come come and run with my training group for for a couple of years, and you know this is a huge debate. Like are are, are runners skinny because they're n- naturally destined to be skinny and that's why they're runners, or 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 are they skinny because there's something about running eighty miles a week that makes you skinny, and I think there's probably a bit, a bit of both. I, I had a, I remember like ten years ago, I had a conversation with Gary Tobbs about this, and his argument was, yeah, you know, it, it, running doesn't make you skinny. It's just that people who are skinny end up running, and that that may be true in a lot of cases. But everyone who's been in a running group has also seen people who are overweight join the group, stick with it over the long period of time. It's hard, but but and, and end up dropping large amounts of weight. So so my belief is that. You know, absolutely, it's uh, weight loss is far more complicated than just oh, if you do more exercise, you'll burn more calories and then you, you'll lose weight because there are all sorts of compensating factors. There's behavioral compensators like the fact that you're, you, you know, you if you you exercise more, you'll you'll be hungrier. And there's also sort of invisible compensating factors, changes in your metabolism that, that fight to keep whatever weight you've been at. So so it's absolutely complicated. But if you're burning enough calories through exercise. I absolutely believe it's a it's a contributing factor to it can be a contributing factor to weight loss. Uh, although you shouldn't, you sh- that doesn't mean you should be out eating Twinkies nonetheless. And the, the one other thing that I think is maybe underappreciated is there's a pretty significant body of literature that suggests that in people who exercise at least a moderate amount, they're better at matching their appetite cues to their caloric needs. So, you know, obviously like a thousand years ago, people just ate when they were hungry or they ate when they could get food or whatever. But, but even when they had access to relatively copious food, they, they didn't necessarily eat more than they needed. And there's, there's some interesting evidence that suggests when you look at appetite cues and, and, and you know, freely chosen food intake, people who exercise tend to be more able to automatically eat the amount that they need. When, and when you get to people who are completely sedentary, 
that that system kind of breaks and they no longer their appetite cues are, are no longer in tune somehow something about exercise keeps that intake and outflow balance better so so in that sense exercise's main benefit may be not that it burns extra calories but that it helps calibrate your your sense of appetite to the amount of calories you actually need well and you also talk about that a type of exercise might increase or de- or might increase the chances of you burning fat. Because a lot of people think, well, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm just going to get on the treadmill and get in that fat burning zone for an hour and I'll lose weight. But you say like people forget like strength training often contributes more to fat loss than, than cardio. Yeah. Well, there's, and there's the fat burning zone. Boy, you, you, you just pushed a red button there. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, there's a few, there's, there's different things. For one thing, if you build muscle, muscle is very metabolically active and helps burn calories and control blood sugar levels. So, so having more muscle is, is a huge advantage for controlling weight. There's also, th- you know, obviously high intensity interval training is, is, has been a big trend over the last 10 years and doing high intensity work can contribute to extra calorie burn that persists for a while after a workout. So, but I mean, in terms of the fat burning zone, I mean, there is some truth to the fact that if you go relatively easily on a treadmill, then you will, or, or, or in whatever, whatever, not even on a treadmill. And what, if, if you're, if your intensity of exercise is low, you'll burn mostly fat. And if you're, if, as you push and go harder and harder, you'll start to burn a higher and higher percentage of carbohydrate. But it's a total misinterpretation to think, ah, therefore I should exercise as easily as possible so that I'm burning 90% fat instead of 10% fat. Because if you're, Going really easily, you're, the total number of calories you're burning is 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 low. So then you're like, well, I'm burning ninety percent of ten calories an hour. It's better to be burning fifty percent fat at a hundred calories an hour. So, and and the only reason, I mean, in theory, the, if you want to burn the most fat, you should be just sprinting all out. Now the problem is you can't sustain sprinting all out for you know more than a few minutes. You can't you can't say I'm just going to sprint for an hour. So. Oh, the way a lot of exercise programs evolve is to tr- have evolved is to try and balance that to have a mix of intensity, high intensity and low intensity, so that you're accumulating longer duration, but also high intensity. Uh, you're mixing up, you're hitting different energy systems, and that's going to maximize the amount of calories you're able to burn overall during an exercise program. Now, the other thing I would say about fat burning zones, not to complicate it even more, is ultimately, although this is this is again a controversial area of debate in, in research, I don't think it really matters which calories you burn. If you, if you burn carbohydrates, if you burn fat, it's all essentially one big pot in terms of the, the, the fuel that, that is then coming in from your next meal. If you've burned your calorie store, your carbohydrate stores, then your next meal is going to re- go to replenishing those carbohydrate stores rather than filling up your fat stores. So whether you burn carbs or fat is just, again, one of those details where it's like, if we can go back to it, doing something is better than nothing. I wouldn't like say, oh, I need to be at 65% of my heart rate, not 72%. It's like, dude, do whatever is fun and sustainable. And, and that, that's going to be your best bet rather than trying to micro-engineer the, the intensity. Yeah, and the, the whole, the, as you were talking, it made me think, I think a lot of people, when they think fat burning zone, there's also a misconception of how metabolism works. They're thinking, oh, I'm in the fat burning zone. I'm burning stored fat right now. Probably not. You're probably burning dietary fat that you consumed, you know, last night at dinner. So you're not yeah, even touching yeah, your yeah. fat stores yet. Yeah. If if and then, you know, this maybe goes to another question, but it's like, no, you can't. You know, I'm doing core exercises, so therefore I'm burning the fat off my belly or whatever. No, no, that's not how it works. You, you're you're burning from the giant pot of energy you have. You you can't target or spot burn fat from specific areas. It's that's, that's just not how it works. All right. So those Instagram influencers don't listen to them. <laughs> Who true. knew? Who, Who knew, knew that they weren't, uh, you know, fonts of knowledge? <laughs> right. Well, let's talk about uh, endurance, just sort of endurance athletics, endurance uh, fitness, because this is your wheelhouse. One question you explore is whether there's a correct or incorrect way to run. And I think people who are who do 5Ks or marathons, they've probably read books on how they should improve their form and decrease injuries. Is there, is there anything to that or is there just run however your body feels naturally it wants to run? Yeah, this is this is again. Uh, you've you've successfully picked a, a like a third rail topic that gets people really. Worked I know. Up. Yeah. I, what I would say is there is no quote unquote correct way to run. I will acknowledge that there are some incorrect ways to run. So there's not one way you should run, but there are some things to be 
avoided. And, you know, the, the classic one would be overstriding. You often see less experienced runners taking these big, long steps, crashing down on their heels way in front of their bodies. It's not very efficient. It's not, uh, it's not, it's harder on the, on the joints. I would say in most cases, if you just spend some time running, your body, the feedback you get from your body will help you iron out those problems that you will, you will sort of naturally evolve into a fairly efficient and fairly comfortable running stride. That's certainly how I learned to run. Uh, now, if you see me run, you will say, dude, you should have like learned to run properly. You look like an idiot. And that's, people have been telling me that for a long time. So I, I you know, I, I, I'm open to the, there are running coaches out there who, who have a lot of ideas about form. I'm open to the idea that they may have some useful tips for some people. Certainly there's lots of satisfied customers out there who are like, I used to run, you know, like a, like a hippopotamus with a broken leg. Now I, I flow down the street, just feels wonderful. I'm, I'm happy for those people in, in the, in the scientific realm, in the, in the, if we look at studies of running form, of cha- making changes to running form to see if you can ma- become more efficient, the general consensus is whenever you make a change to someone's running form, they become less efficient and it becomes harder to, to like it's mentally harder. And it's also, even when people feel it's actually better, it's measurably less efficient. So I'm still a, a believer in mostly just run how you feel. And if, but maybe if a, if a knowledgeable observer tells you you're doing something crazily wrong, you know, you've got your arms completely straight by your sides or behind your head or something like that, there may be some useful advice to you. I guess, you know, sorry not to ramble on in this, but I, I, I do remember watching the New York Marathon one year. And, you know, I'm a fan of the elite side of the sport. So I usually watch on TV and see, and, and the camera's focused. 90% of the time on, you know, the lead pack and they're all running, you know, with these smooth, beautiful strides, but a couple times watching with friends on the sidelines and, you know, cheering on the people who are not just running two hour marathons, but who are running three hours and four hours and five hours. And it's like, okay, I'll admit it at the five hour range. You're seeing some people with some pretty peculiar running form sometimes, not everybody, but, but you occasionally you see people like, Ah, I th- I bet I could give a tip to that person that might help them run a little more smoothly. So it's not that it's impossible to improve, but I think in in general, most of these pieces of advice, like you have to have a running cadence of 180 steps per minute, or you must ensure that your feet land in this particular way, like on the on the toes rather than on the heel or whatever. A lot of them have these sort of bioplausible narratives where it sounds reasonable, but the more research you do and the more you test it, the more you find it's like. Huh, actually that didn't make anybody better. It didn't make anybody more efficient. It didn't make them less injured. It didn't it, it didn't actually help after all. So if there is a perfect running form, we we haven't really identified how to what it is or how to teach people how to do it. What's the state of barefoot running these days? I remember like when this book came out, it was huge. Like I I was one of those guys who bought Vibram Five Fingers and wore them at the gym. And <laughs> <laughs> they've been in the trash for a long time. Like what's what's going on there? Is it as big or people kind of like cooled on it. It is definitely cooled. I think what a lot of people found is that <laughs> they got hurt. Um, it, it wasn't as easy as they thought. And for the people who succeeded, I think I, I would say, uh, you know, I'm generalizing here, obviously, but I think the people who succeeded did a transition or, or uh, learned to do it very gradually, so gradually that they probably could have learned to run in, in combat boots, you know, doing the same thing just by by giving their body plenty of time to adapt to a new movement pattern. Now, there, there's a lot fewer people out there running in Vibrams or running barefoot than there were 10 years ago. That being said, the whole running shoe market has changed as a result of that. What was, for, for a long time, it was this over-engineered, you know, this idea, you have to control the foot, it wants to pronate, you have to prevent the foot from pronating, we need pronation control and these all these big, pieces of plastic stuck inside the shoe. Minimalism, p- absolute pure minimalism, running bare feet, which makes a lot of sense from a sort of logical and evolutionary perspective, turned out to be something that's very, very hard for most people to do if they've grown up in, in you know, Western society. But what, what would, that, that forced, the, that whole movement forced shoe companies t- to sort of look inward and reflect and say, are these, are these shoes we're selling, do they actually do anything? Like, do we have good evidence? And you know, I would say the general answer was, uh, a lot of what we're doing is not really supported. It's not useful. So maybe we should simplify shoes, make them a little lighter, make them a little more flexible and more sort of able to move naturally like the foot. And so 
I certainly am one person who I didn't go minimalist, but I run in much lighter shoes than I did 10 years ago. And the array of shoes that are available to people on, in stores is a lot different and a lot lighter. And I think that's, that's good because even if not everyone runs in the same shoe, there's a, there's a bigger menu of options available to people now to, to find a shoe that, that fits for them and that, that, makes, that makes them feel good running. So another part of the, when you talked about running in the book, you talked about, is there really a runner's high? And you likened it to a Yeti because you hear a lot of people talk about it, but not a lot of people have experienced it. I remember like a few years ago, I got really into running and I never felt like I always felt just not great after a run. So does a runner's high actually exist or is that overblown? Yeah. it's. It, I mean, I, I think it does exist. I think the people who report it are, are legit, but I think I, I feel the, the reason I feel bad is precisely because of what you're saying. People are like, people who get into running are like, oh, I'll get this amazing, like euphoric high. And then like, no, actually I just want to like lie down and pass out. I don't feel like a high. And I've, I've been running for a billion years and I, you know, I've never experienced that sort of euphoric high. What, what I get when I'm lucky is a, a sort of feeling of satisfaction that, you know, life is good. And it's hard to separate that f- from, Maybe I'm just feeling like, hey, I just went out and did something hard. I achieved a goal that I'd set for myself and I've done something good today. And so I'm feeling good about that. Is that just because I I did that or is it because my brain chemistry has changed? And it took me a while to sort of conclude that, yeah, there's probably some brain chemistry changes. I'm just a little calmer after, after if I get a run done in the morning. Um, yeah, I just feel a, a subtly better about things. So the, the the research on runner's high, I mean, it's hard because, because the sort of euphoric high is so rare, it's hard to study it because there's so few people who who actually experience that. But what they what they there, there have been a lot of studies, and the, the consensus now, or at least the, the the sort of feeling now is that it's not just, you know, endorphins or you know, one particular chemical. There's actually a whole bunch of different things. There's endocannabinoids, which are basically the body's version of marijuana and, you know, endorphins, which are the body's version of opioids like morphine. And, and there's various other chemicals like dopamine and all of these to different degrees in different people are stimulated by prolonged exercise. That's moderately hard. So what, if you, if you're sprinting, you don't get the, the same change in brain chemistry. If you're really just, you know, going out for a brisk walk, you don't get that same change. So I think that's why it's tends to be runner's high is that, Running just happens to be an activity that favors, you know, you to to go out and be able to be moderately hard for a prolonged period of time. It's not like cycling where you can just take your feet off the pedals, so you, you tend to coast a little more. The intens- intensity tends to be a little lower. It's not like swimming where, you have, if you're like me, at least you have to work relatively hard to avoid drowning. So it's it's it it hits that middle ground, and I think for most people, it's it's a much more subtle change in mood or change in brain chemistry. That, that may not happen with every run for sure. And that may be more of a cumulative thing too, that it's something that over time it changes your mood. But yeah, the, the sort of, you know, I'm floating through the universe in touch with with all the human race. Uh, I, I personally have never met anyone who experienced that. Well, and those brain boosting or mood boosting benefits of cardio are one reason why strength athletes should also incorporate cardio into their workout programming. Yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah, I, I can give you a lot of reasons that I think uh, a, a little bit of uh, endurance training is a good idea. One, one of them is that, yeah, the most reliable, you know, for, for any benefit of exercise, there's usually a, a set of studies of different forms of exercise saying, oh yeah, well, you can get this from strength training too, or you can get this from, you know, circuit training or CrossFit or whatever the case may be. And I think there's there's some truth to that, but the most reliable way of getting the mood changing benefits of exercise uh, is definitely mo- the vast majority of the research is with aerobic exercise. And that extends to for things like cognitive benefits. Cause you know, there's as, as a guy in my mid forties, as you know, staring down the tunnel of life, I'm starting to read more studies about like, Hey, how do I keep my marbles as I, as I get older, you know, try and stave off cognitive decline. And there's, there's pretty good evidence. There's very good evidence for, for aerobic exercise, stimulating, brain growth factors that keep your brain healthy. There's also evidence for resistance training, but they're different pathways. So you're not, you're missing out on something if you're not doing some aerobic exercise. And then, you know, move, moving outside the brain, there's also some of the metabolic benefits of exercise. It's just, it, it's clear that resistance training is really healthy for you in a lot of different ways, but it doesn't max out your benefits in terms of you know, keeping your blood pressure and your blood sugar levels and things like that at, at optimal levels. All right, let's move over to strength training. You talk about the core. Now, for the past decade, we've probably everyone's probably seen 
you know, magazine articles, blog posts, infomercials about strengthening your core. What exactly is the core and do exercise help anything with that? Yeah. So I would say anything that's gotten as much hype as the core has gotten in the last decade or, or so is, is almost by definition overhyped. Like it's important, but it's not like more important than, you know, your feet muscles or whatever. Like you want to be stable while well, you have to have, you know, strong, there, there's like, I don't know, 14 muscles in your feet. All those have to be strong and balanced and stable too, if you're going to have good balance. So, so core is, is, uh, it's important and it's just one of those things that maybe caught on and got a little overhyped. But I think people tend to think of the core as like, it's a six pack. Like if you have a good a six pack, you have a good core. And that's, that's too narrow a view because really what you want when you talk about core from a functional point of view is you want something that's giving you stability. Uh, that's, that's, you know, allowing, giving you a good base from which to, to use your strength. And so, you have to kind of broaden the definition just from from the abs out to the 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 hips and the, the pelvis, and there, you know there have been a bunch of interesting studies that look at, uh, you know, in in running, for example, in looks at look at things like knee injuries, runner's knee, and find that there's a really strong correlation between you know runner's knee problems and weak hips. That if you don't have strong hips, you're you're more likely to have your knees turning inwards when you run and putting strain on on that knee joint. So that's a, that's a you know one example of a case where yeah, if you don't have a strong core, that can manifest in problems in other places in your body. And so it is good to have a good core. What I think what the the thing to avoid is to, to interpret that as you should do a ton of crunches every night. Right, because those crunches are just exercising those superficial muscles on your abs that don't really do anything. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. So th- there's better core exercises, and there's also a sort of a broader definition of 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 what the core is, and and you know how how broad it might be. So, but at a certain point, once you're doing you know hip exercises and pelvic exercises and back exercises, then it's like, well, I'm not really exercising the core anymore. This is just exercise. This is part of a, a good balanced exercise program. Right. And you, I mean, you could work the core, quote unquote, just by doing deadlifts and squats because that engages the hips, the lower back in that ab, that ab part. I, I would say there's probably no better way. Like that's, that's, that's the ultimate. If you, if you can do those well, uh, that's a pretty good sign that your core is in good shape. All right. So no, no plank. You don't have to do, no planks required if you don't want to. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> planks are not the worst thing in the world, but, but uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you're deadlifting and squatting, then, then that's, that's going to be challenging your core in, in all the ways that are important. So what about body weight exercises? Are those just as beneficial as weight training? I'm, I'm imagining the answer to this, and we've, this sort of conversation, the way it's been going is like, yeah, because it's something. <laughs> yeah. Or, or since I answered every question, well, it depends then, uh, you know, yeah, you can see where it's going. Yeah. I would say, I, I think this is, this is, uh, you know, an important point for, for strength training in general. It's like, what is your goal? Do you want to be, you know, Mr. Olympia or, and do, or do you want to go to the Olympics or do you want to be healthy and strong and, and, you know, look good or whatever. And for, for the 99% of us who aren't concerned with the last sort of 0.01%, you have a lot more flexibility in how you train. So I, the, the, what I'm thinking of right now is there, there's, there's some really interesting research from McMaster university that has over the course of about half a dozen studies has compared light, light loads with heavy loads. And the question is, you know, if you look at the standard guidelines and think, you know, I need to be lifting at whatever, 70 or 80 or 90% of my one rep max. Well, what happens if you lift at 30% of what your one rate max, one rep max? And the answer is, if you lift a failure, so if you lift like 25 reps per set, you end up getting virtually the same gains, not 100% identical, not at the sort of at the very edge of the curve, are you getting the absolute most of yourself, but you get pretty much the same gains in muscle and in strength. And that's with 30% one rep max. So with body weights, with body weight exercises, obviously you have, you know, much more, you're much more limited in terms of how you can vary the load. But what this research tells us is, yeah, you know, if you want to do push-ups and pull-ups and, and, uh, you know, dips and things like that, you can, you can get a pretty good workout as long as you work hard enough to go to just failure. If you want to take it to, you know, the, the ultimate absolute, maximizing the benefits, then you're probably going to want to be able to lift with heavy loads. And particularly, I would say for the lower body, there's, it's one thing I, I, you know, most of us can get a pretty good, good workout 
uh, and I'm saying this, uh, this is a dramatic understatement. Most of us don't need to do like 25 pull-ups to reach failure, you know, per set. So it's easy to, to fully challenge yourself with body weight for the upper body for the legs. It's a lot harder. You know, you, you can try and isolate, you know, one legged Romanian squats or what is that split squats or whatever, but really to get your legs exercised, I'd say there, it's a lot harder to, to get the full benefits, uh, f- from a body weight program. So a lot of people exercise because they're trying to counter that sedentary lifestyle they have because they're sitting down at work all day. When they're at home, they're kind of not really doing much. And they say, well, I got my exercise in. I moved my body. That's going to counter all that. Is that true? Uh, but in, in keeping with my pattern, I'll say it p- p- partly true, but not entirely true. You know, and I'll say this, I'll, I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you here from my adjustable desk. I, I'm one of the people who, who ended up getting a desk that allows me to stand for part of the day, although certainly not all of it, uh, or, uh, you know, maybe a, an eighth of the day or something. I, I see, I see fewer headlines about this, uh, these days than, than five or six or seven years ago, all about the dangers of, of sitting and how sitting is the new smoking and all, and all that. And I think, you know, th- what your question is getting at is, 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 is there something that's bad about sitting that's more than just the fact that you're not exercising? Like, can you, as long as you get enough exercise, can you sit as much as you want? And I would say the evidence suggests that those are two different things. It's like, so you could say, you know, how much do I have to exercise to counterbalance the, the, the negative health effects of smoking, just to take an obvious example. It's like, well, in terms of life expectancy, maybe there is a number. Maybe if you exercise, maybe smoking one cigarette a day will reduce your life expectancy by one year and exercising half an hour a day will increase it by one year. And therefore, you can balance the two by smoking one cigarette and exercising one half an hour a day or whatever the, the case may be. But but that wouldn't be correct to say that then exercising eliminates the effects of the cigarette. All you're doing is balancing two completely different things. And that the same is true, I think, with sitting and with prolonged sitting and exercising. The part of the problem with being working a desk job is yeah, that you're sitting all day, so you're not getting exercise, you're not burning calories, that you're not you know, using your muscles. And so part of the problem with sitting is lack of exercise, but there's another part that seems to be just a a direct response to being totally motionless for hours at a time that levels of your your muscles basically go into standby mode. They, they, they realize they're not being used The levels of the enzymes that, that draw in, you know, blood sugar and things like that drop. And so you're, you're no longer in a metabolically normal state and your blood sugar is rising, so you have to then secrete insulin to keep it under control. And even if you exercised for an hour that morning, if you're then sitting motionless for eight hours continuously, or for 14 hours when you add in, you know, your Netflix time that evening, then you're th- there's some negative health effects that aren't being balanced just by exercising enough. So it's still not entirely clear what you do to counteract that nobody knows like well do you have to get up once every hour once every half hour once every two hours can you get up for 10 seconds or for a minute or five minutes is standing up enough or do you have to do jumping jacks or go up a flight of stairs nobody knows nobody knows but i think i would say you know a reasonable rule of thumb is you know try to get out of your chair at least once an hour if you have the option to stand up occasionally stand up you know you know once every couple hours and if you're able to work you know work for half an hour standing up and if you have the, you know, for me, it's like, I actually leave my landline phone downstairs. And so when it rings, it's a pain in the neck, but I have to run downstairs to get it. So it just forces me to, to make sure I don't actually sit at my desk nonstop for all day, except for lunch. I, you know, I, it just ma- makes me go up and down the stairs a couple of times. It's not a workout, but it's, it's just reminding my muscles that, Hey, you can't be in dormant mode. I have to be able to, to move around. So let's talk about a question I thought was really fun. You explored was Music. Does music help anything when you're working out or does it distract? Yes, to both. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I think everyone who's ever done a, a, you know, a workout with the right music pounding either in their ears or over the loudspeaker knows that it can be really, really inspirational. It can, it can really get you in the groove. And so there, there was all this research that tried to identify, it's like, what is the optimum beat of the music? You know, is there a right key that you have to have it in or a genre? What makes good music? And the results always were all over the map. And, you know, so one thing people realized is that music isn't just sound. People have associations with music. And the songs that to me might make me remember something 
you know, some great moment or a, tr- a triumph or a girl who dumped me or whatever, like they're different for every person. And so the personal associations you bring to music are really crucial. So there is never going to be a sort of universal playlist of music that makes people run fast or, or, or lift more weight. But there, but if you find the right music and generally it's up-tempo music and if it has lyrics, it's music that have lyrics that are, you know, if not inspirational, then at least encouraging. It's not sort of a, a sort of, you know, depressing ballad or anything that's unlikely to max out your, your performance. It can definitely help you. And that's, that's been shown over and over again. Now, one, the, the, the caveat that's important to keep in mind is that music can make fe- exercise feel easier. Sometimes it makes it feel easier because you've decided to go easier. So you're like, oh yeah, I was on the bike. I put, put on the tunes and it just felt so easy. And then if you actually look at like the, the power you're up and it's like, oh, it's because I was barely moving my legs because I was focused on the music and listening to the music. And so what they find is the more engaged you are in the music or, for, you know, with the new comparisons between music and watching a video, watching a video is more engaging. So when you let people self-select their, their exercise intensity, they go easier and easier the, the more engaged they are. So if it's like a podcast or music or a video that you're really, really into, you're likely to slow down unconsciously. So the the sort of additional thing I would say is, first of all, bear in mind, like, you know, keep an eye on your pace or on your effort level or do a form of exercise. Like if you're on the treadmill and you set it for eight minute miles, then it doesn't matter if you're distracted. And if you get into it, then that's great. It's taking your mind off the effort of maintaining eight minute miles and you're not slowing down. And if you're lifting weights, you know, you're choosing what weight to lift. So it's not like you're like, oh, I didn't even notice I was lifting 10 pounds instead of a hundred pounds. You, you know, you choose what weight you lift. So it's not a concern, but in the, in those modalities where you're, where you're freely choosing your exercise intensity, it's easy to be like, to drift off, get, and be like, this feels so great. And then realize that's because you're barely working. Yeah. I used to listen to music a lot when I, like all the time when I try I haven't like for the past few months I've just sort of naturally haven't like not turned on the speaker till when I trained and I actually enjoyed a lot more which is weird I I, I will uh, I, I will definitely avoid you know judging either way because people have strong feelings I'll say for me running I it's it's a time for me to be alone with my thoughts and and I I love music a lot and so for me if I have music that's where my mind is I'm following the music and so I I value getting outside and running and just letting my mind wander. And it's amazing where, you know, where my mind ends up. And I don't, you know, I, I don't remember most of the time, but it's like, wow, how did I end up thinking about that? And I, I, I have this sort of totally irrational and unfounded belief that that's kind of good for me to, to, to have some time to let my, you know, in this busy overscheduled world to have some time to let my mind wander free. Yeah. And I tried listening to podcasts while working on that. I just was too distracted. Like I, I was distracted from the podcast like because I, I was so focused on training that I couldn't listen. And also like the podcast distracted my training. So I just like, yeah, ah, I'm not going to do that. You, it, it, that's exactly, I think the, you, your experience is, is the classic sort of pitfall of something that's too good and too interesting. You, you, you're not giving you hundred percent of attention to either of the things. And, and those are both things you would like to be giving hundred percent of your attention to. All right. The sound of silence. Well, Alex, this has been a lot of fun. There's so many more questions people can read about in the book. Where can people find out more information about what you're doing now and what you're working on? Yeah, probably the easiest easiest place to find me is on Twitter. My uh, my handle is sweat science, all one word, and that's where I post you know any, anything I find interesting or new articles that I've written. I do have a website, alexhutchinson.net, where there's sort of obscure details about my long buried past, like the fact that I wrote a book called "Which Comes First, Cardio or Weights." So uh, those are probably the two the two best places to go. Awesome. Well, Alex, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Brad. I really, uh, really enjoyed the conversation. My guest today was Alex Hutchinson. He is the author of the book, Which Comes First, Cardio Awaits, and his latest book, Endure. Check him out. They're both available on Amazon. You can find out more information about his work at his website, alexhutchinson.com, or follow him on Twitter at, at Sweat Science. And check out our show notes at aom.is slash fitnessfaq, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.